Have you ever wondered what it's like to be a translator or an interpreter? Are you perhaps considering that kind of career path? Are you taking classes? Well, I'm super excited to introduce today's guest. He is a professor of translation at Kuwait University. He's a fellow lexicographer. He's done two books, one on euphemisms and one on Kuwaiti expressions and phrases. And by the way, lexicographer is someone who compiles dictionaries. So like for me, I have uh, American slang and I'm Yelam Rekia, right? Side note. Sorry for the shameless plug. Actually, not sorry. I was so impressed by the depth of knowledge that he has in both English and Arabic. I was just blown away. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Please welcome Dr. Mohammed bin Nasser. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you so much for talking to me, first of all. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm all honored, actually. So I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in translation. Yes, well, um, I, I've always been interested in the English language. And the funny thing is, uh, I'm actually a Kuwaiti. Uh, I was born and raised in Kuwait. Um, I lived in Canada when I was two for six months. My, my dad had to go there, relocate there just for six months. Um, basically, uh, Minister, of Interior, Minister of Interior Workshop. So I could say, Although I was almost two years, I don't remember anything there, but my mom told me that was my first interaction with native speakers. Um, I've learned the English language along with the Arabic language. So I could say my acquisition of the English language is, is quite synonymous and in parallel with, with the Arabic one. And um, I don't know why, I don't have any reason, Just just, it's just fascination with the English language. Um, I started to, I actually became a professional couch potato. So I watched the Saturday night, Saturday night cartoons. Um, I watched sitcoms, wrestling. Um, I watched all the cartoons of the 80s. I'm a product of the 80s. Uh, so you could say I watched G.I. Joe, I watched Thundercats, oh, yeah. Transformers, everything. Knight Rider. Uh, wrestling. Oh yeah, Knight Rider, exactly. <laughs> the English I learned was the English of the TV shows. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, another, another. Um, this may this may sound weird for today's youth, but my generation, the generation of the '80s, uh, in Kuwait, you learn English um, in, in middle school. So in elementary, you don't, you don't, you don't. There are no English classes. You start in middle school. But those who were born in the 90s, their English starts in elementary, so early. Okay. Um, when, I, when we first started to attend those English classes, um, I hate to blow my own horn. I, I was the only one who actually spoke English in class. And, and, and I, I remember students used to gather on my table and I, was just, I would read for them short sentences. But to them, to them I was like a rock star, uh, which is nothing, to be honest. It's, that was my first. That was my first encounter with with the English language. Mm -hmm. um, in college, I I actually enrolled in in English linguistics. Okay. So I studied I studied English um, throughout my 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 journey and and at the university, you major in in linguistics, but you do take literature classes. And when you major in linguistics and also in literature, you do take four courses in translation. Uh, that was my first okay. test. Uh, nowadays, we actually teach it as a minor. So my BA as a background, my BA ba background is English linguistics. Once I, once I um, graduated from Kuwait University, I received a full scholarship to pursue both my MA and my PhD in translation studies. Oh. Um, and, I was, and I was shipped straight to the United Kingdom to study there. Um, I passed my PhD uh, or obtained my PhD in 2010. So you could say 11 years ago. Um, so I've been teaching translation for the past 11 years. Wow, that's so impressive. And I know you said, so you went to Canada when you were young and that's kind of when you first started like hearing English from native speakers and things. Did your parents speak English? Um, they were product of their time. So their English was communication English or tourist okay. English. Okay. And what about like, did you have brothers and sisters who were also learning with you? I was the oldest. <laughs> so okay. I was, 
That was the trial by fire, son. <laughs> I love it. Um, that's so cool. And so um, when you went to study in the UK, though, was that a bit of a shock? Because you said you had been watching American shows. Um, and so was yeah. it like to learn British English? Was that kind of, I mean, a challenge for you, especially working as a linguist or, or as a translation major there? You, you get picked on for speaking American English there. <laughs> <laughs> so for saying and the funny thing because I used to watch wrestling when I was a kid and announcers in wrestling are from the south so you pick up on southern idioms and southern expressions and when I used them there they used they used to laugh at me like were you born in a barn <laughs> oh man and so I had I had to adjust to the proper British accent being super formal, being euphemistic, being diplomatic. I'm not saying that American English is not American English. It indicates uh, the friendliness of the North American people. But yeah, switching from, uh, by the way, I never picked up on the British accent, um, <laughs> uh, as you can see. Uh, you can never teach an old dog new tricks. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I would say uh, I'm, I learned or I acquired those words or those expressions, the, the British expressions. But yeah, I stayed true to um, what I learned when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Well, and when you were growing up too, like you, so you spoke Kuwaiti, I mean, would you say, would you call it Kuwaiti dialect? Like, I mean, or would you call it like a specific, because I know within Saudi, so, oh, I speak Najdi or I speak Hejazi. Oh yeah, it? oh yeah, in, in Saudi Arabia, Whereas in Kuwait, do you all just say it's Kalam Kuwaiti? Like you don't say, "Oh, we speak Lahajat al Kabila," the or anything. Yeah, in Kuwait, in Kuwait, because it's um, it's such a small, diminutive country, geographically speaking, uh, we only have one dialect, the Kuwaiti dialect. Uh, you're either Hadhari or Abdui, so you're either from the people who live the maritime culture, or you're from those who live the the nomadic culture. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's the, the, the only difference is the accents. So in Kuwaiti Arabic, you only speak, I mean, there's only one dialect. The difference is the, is the accent between uh, either Havag or Badu. Okay. But yeah, I, I, I understand the, the Saudi, uh, I think, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I think there are 27 dialects in, the, in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Just within Saudi? Oh, that's amazing. Because I know online they'll say, oh, like there are 25 plus dialects of Arabic. But I'm like, no, within Saudi, they have a, a bunch. Yeah. So that's really, yeah, that's really interesting. But I noticed too, like, well, since you had this experience of like, you know, learning American English and then going to the UK, I wonder if that compares to like, you know how like for Arabic learners, um, mm -hmm. each like Lebanese are very proud of their dialect. They say, oh, you need to learn Lebanese. It's the most uh, fasih in all this. And then or the Saudis will say, oh, you need to learn Hijazi. Or Hijazi is the closest to Quran. Or the, you know, everybody will have the, like their kind of regional pride in their dialect. Whereas between like American English, British English, I mean, what do you think? What was that dynamic like? Between American and British? Yeah, I mean, kind of like, do you feel that there was that kind of a similar sense of pride? Yeah, I've noticed, well, the, I would, uh, it's it's uh, I think that's that's an intricate question that you asked because in the UK is uh, I mean uh, probably the, both of us we assumed uh, have you ever been to the UK uh, yeah I've been a few times yeah I studied uh, abroad there once yeah so you've only been to London or you've you've uh, have you discovered the other major cities so I was in uh, University of Warwick so I was closer to Birmingham like Birmingham I guess like, for a bit and then I, but I was also mm -hmm. I've been to London a few times so I know there's like the different you know pronunciation they're kind of different accents within yeah know. I learned that the hard way I thought yeah. like the, the rest of the most of us Arabs will learn English um, the books that we received um, in, in our schools in public schools were at that time were um, British books shall we say. So you learn the nursery rhymes of the British, London's Burning, and all of those, um, the British folklore. So the, 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 the accent that we learn is, is definitely the, the, the accent used in London, mm -hmm. the, or, or let's just say the BBC accent. Uh, I think they call it in sociolinguistics, uh, the RP or the uh, received pronunciation. Uh, Similar okay. to the Queen's English. Queen's English. But when you okay. go there, when you go there, you realize, as you said, in Birmingham, they have the Brummy accent. In Manchester, the Mancunian accent. In Newcastle, it's the Geordie accent. Oh. Uh, Liverpool, it's the Scousey. It's a okay. different ball game. Mm -hmm. uh, every city has its own dialect, and every city has its own flavor. Every city has its own 
slang. Every city has its own pronunciation. And you, you, you would say, yes, every city has its pride, shows its pride of its own accent. And when you were doing your studies uh, in the UK on translation, what was your kind of main um, interest? Like what kind of like most excited you about translation? I would say culture. Mm -hmm. Culture, um, idioms, proverbs, similar to what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, I think there's something that you said, I would like to quote you on this, that when you said that those who want to learn Arabic, they should learn these expressions and these phrases because they are the window to the culture of, 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 of the, the, that target culture. And to me, that was, I'd rather translate idioms and proverbs than translate. Because every, when everybody, somebody hears about the concept of translation, they instantly think about uh, translating fiction, novels. That's, that's one of 20 different activities in translation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, that was what interests me, translating culture, translating, um, I would say, I hate to use that word because in post-colonial studies, they say translating the other. It has a negative connotation, but I do mean it with, with a very positive connotation um, because translation is basically a bridge between different cultures. It is, yeah. Yeah. And, and can you talk about, so after you got your PhD, um, what was your kind of, how did your journey kind of transition into working in Kuwait University and like things like that? Well, at uh, Kuwait University, you either, as a professor, you either specializes in linguistics, literature, or translation. Because I, because I, um, I specialize in translation, I, I mainly have to teach and we offer 10 different courses on translation, which is really extensive. And it, it ranges between literary and technical. So those who are interested in literature and translating literature, these courses do offer that. Uh, there are courses on translating uh, science, technology, uh, subtitling, interpreting, you name it. Uh, I don't teach interpreting. Uh, I think that's, it. well, I would say that's on my bucket list, but um, I'm more of into translation than interpreting. So I would say the journey is basically, hopefully mold future translators. And uh, you could also say working on dictionaries as well. That's, that's another part of the journey. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that in your um, bio, like you're a lexicographer. So can you talk about like how you got involved in that? Yes, we do offer at the department and we were when we were students, we had to take a course on lexicography and in that particular course, you have to uh, for a, for a graduation project, you have to come up with a manuscript of a topic of your own choosing. So you do have the freedom as a student, pick any topic you want and uh, they, they can, let's say you imagine you want to be a lexicographer, you want to produce a dictionary. That is, that is your only chance. That is your only window to do that. Um, me being a nerd, I, I actually came up with two. Nerds <laughs> and, my <tonight>. professor, <laughs> <laughs> and my professor actually uh, greenlit both of them. The first one was American idioms. I was um, fascinated with, with idioms. And the second one was a dictionary of musical genres. Uh, so basically me trying to, uh, I would say, uh, not just translate, but also explain what is the difference between rap and heavy metal? What is the difference between subgenres? So how can you explain uh, in a dictionary gangster rap or heavy metal, thrash metal, techno, rave, any of that? Uh, I found dictionaries to be really fascinating. Um, so my journey in lexicography started with that particular course uh, as a student, and I continued for more, from, from that forward. Even with my main, my PhD in both uh, theses, uh, in my research dissertations, I tried to bridge the gap between translation and lexicography mm -hmm. um, to the detriment of my supervisors, to be honest with you, because they were, they were no fans of lexicography. <laughs> no, I, I noticed because I, I was looking, you know, I was in preparing for this interview. Like I looked at some of, you know, some of these like papers you've done on trans like translating compounds and idafa and like I was I'm super impressed first of all and like I think that you know it's really I mean what you've been able to do is so incredible because I feel like Arabic is one of those languages it's like it's not like translating English and Spanish like it's like not only 
is it like complex but like when we're typing the, like when you're typing these papers like how frustrating is it as a as like a writer to have to switch uh, alignment oh, like every time I'm switching from English to Arabic it's like switching the okay now it has to be right aligned and then why is the period always on the right side and it should be on the left because I'm right you know all this kind of stuff so I mean what kind of like tools have you found or what uh, methods you use to kind of like lessen the frustration of like being of like you know switching back and forth all the time um because i learned because i learned the two languages almost simultaneously together um it was easy for me to switch between the two code code switching between the two mm -hmm. uh i was once asked a question by a classmate of mine in the uk a british student he asked me a question that uh, when when he asked me at that time i didn't know what to answer um, he asked me, when you think, do you think in English or do you think in an Arabic? I froze. I didn't know what to say. I mean, my jaw dropped. I didn't know. How can I answer that question? Um, mm -hmm. Mentally speaking. So I could ask the same question to you, Shannon. When you, when you think, do you think in English or do you think in Arabic? Or depending on the situation. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. And I've gotten not that question, but also like, do you dream? Like, oh, if, if you dream in a foreign language, it means that you're like, You've got it. But for me, I mean, when I try to think about my dreams, I don't remember a lot of my dreams, but oftentimes I don't, my dreams are very silent. Like, I don't know if I remember like words as opposed to feelings in my dreams yeah. or like what I'm thinking. I just don't like put it, like articulate it even in my dreams. So I'm like, it's kind of a weird, but like I said, like the question, it's hard to answer because I feel like it kind of depends on the situation. And sometimes I've been in situations where the perfect response for me to say is something that's in Arabic, but there's not a perfect response in English. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to need Wasta for that. <laughs> They're like, what? And I'm like, I can't say it. Like, I don't know, you know, or I'm going to need like, you know, uh, or there's sometimes they'll be like, oh, whatever, who are you said? Like, you, I don't know, you guys in Kuwaiti, you talk about Taslik. Do you talk, use this word Taslik in Kuwaiti? What does Taslik mean? Taslik, like you said, like, so... Taslik is like when somebody, when you're like talking to somebody and they're just like, mm-hmm, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Like, kind of like, it's like, you're, it's like, yeah, kind of like, yeah, I'm just like, uh, uh, okay. Like your, your, your professor, you know, who, who you want to do lexicography and your professor's like, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm, yeah, sure. Do it. Okay. Like they're kind of uh, like, yeah, like nodding along. Humor, you know? humor. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Tasrik, we say in Arabic, but in English, there's not really like a, like, even for me, like I always have to like, be like the only way to explain it is like with a situation, you know? Yeah. Uh, I would say, I would say for us, I don't know if we have a word for it. I think the closest we could say is um, imeshiwiya. Uh, imeshiwiya. Like, mesh from like walking with me. Yeah, but um, but it, it has a, it has a sense of uh, humoring him. You're like he's just going along. along. Yeah, like I'm yeah. going. I'm gonna go along with it. Like yeah, like when a kid is telling you a story, and you're just like, mm -hmm, okay. And you're kind of multitasking. You're like doing your own thing. Oh, okay, sweetie. Okay, sure. That's like taslik. And maybe you say yamshi and amshi wiya. Meshi wiya. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're translating, also, I mean, I'm assuming since you're as a translator, you're you're probably very detail oriented and very analytical. I've seen that we're kind of nerd. Like we, as nerds, we kind of share those qualities. Do you ever find it yeah. interesting? Like, do you ever get caught up in the way when you see something translate a certain way? Like, for example, um, in the sense that sometimes they'll choose to translate things literally, um, like, or or they'll choose to translate them differently. Like, like when I was working in Dubai, like uh, we would, um, they would translate or they would, I guess, subtitle or dub certain American series. So, for example, like Desperate Housewives. The way they mm -hmm. called it in Arabic was Nisa Ha'irat, which is like confused, right? Isn't like confused woman. Yeah, it's not the same name. And I was like, why did they choose that? You know, I mean, do you have moments like this? Oh yeah, every time I go to the movies, um, you know, it grinds my gear when I when I when I read the subtitles and I would see all these basically horrendous translations, sometimes literal translations of of idioms or even cases like uh, the mere expression of 7-Eleven, sometimes is, is mistranslated, mistranslated, butchered in a way. Yeah, oh. that, that grinds me here when it happens. Like 7-Eleven, what do you mean? They, what do they call it? Let's say, for example, the, 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 the store 7-Eleven is mentioned in the movie, and when you, when you look at the subtitle, you say, 
سأذهب إلى سبعة أحد عشر without mentioning what is that it was only one time in on TV series that I saw the subtitle سأذهب إلى متجر so the translator or the subtitle was very clever that he added the word متجر to avoid any confusion to the viewers but yeah I mean there are I mean if I had a nickel every time I would see a mistranslation on, on subtitle, and I think I would be a trillionaire. What are kind of, uh, your, tell, tell me about like, what are your students, like, what do you think are the hardest um, or the biggest hurdles or challenges that your students face in terms of learning how to be good translators? Um, there are uh, th several layers. One of them is learning the accuracy um, of translation. So uh, as you said, there are cases when you said, uh, do I get annoyed if somebody translate differently? Okay, let's say uh, somebody translated um, the idiom. Um, the idiom commits, uh, the, the idiom uh, oh, commits suicide, or oh, the collocation commits suicide. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the only accurate translation of commit suicide. There is no, there is no other alternative. Um, that's the only translation. There are cases where you have an expression that can be translated more than one way. Um, let's say, for example, spill the beans. Both of them are correct, but one of them is more accurate. Because this is yubah, walaysa yukhbar. Choice of the verb. Uh, and th this, this phenomenon in, in linguistics is called collocations. And it is included in every language in the world. It is included in English, it is included in Arabic, and it also included in dialects. And that's how you can spot a native speaker from a non-native speaker, by the choices of those collocations. So when we learned English and when we learned Arabic, they taught us to actually acquire collocations. They are not as fun as idioms, but they are part of the, of the, of the two languages. So there are certain words that come with other words, like Suicide, there's only one verb that is used for suicide, and that is commit. The verb commit has a limited range of words. You can commit suicide, you can commit a sin, you can commit a fraud, you name it. So you have a, a choice of four to five words that come with it. Uh, collocations are really important in translation, and you can spot translation mistakes by looking at the collocations of students. So going back to your original question, what are the layers of difficulty in translation? Could be grammatical, could be phrases, could be culture. Athlaja um, Sadri, the first time I gave a text oh, yeah. where yeah. Sadri, some student translated literally. Um, it, it froze my chest. Uh, my chest and it should be worn my heart. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had maybe two students in that particular class, if my memory serves me correctly that actually translated, warmed my heart instead of uh, whatever, whatever literal translation they provided. From that moment, you realize that some students, not all of them, I, I can't paint them all in the same brush. Some students do lack the ability of knowing what is accepted in the other language. And there is a term for that in linguistics and that is called naturalness in the language. It's natural to say warmed my heart in English and it's natural to say in Arabic. As a translator, you have to know the difference between the two. You have to know why this is, oh, what is accepted in Arabic, what is accepted in, in English. Uh, again, that's that part and parcel of being a bilingual speaker, is, is knowing the ins and out of the two languages. Mm -hmm. There is also a layer of um, politeness. What is polite? What, what is allowed in the language? So, is profanity allowed in, in translation? Yes, it depends on, on, on the topic that you're translating. Some languages do not allow it and some languages would actually welcome it with arms wide open. So it depends on, on the context as well. Uh, and as they say, context is king. And unfortunately, some students are not aware of that. Um, I've had uh, some of my students ask me this question. Um, what is the fastest and the quickest way to, to, to learn and, and to acquire the skills of translation? And I told them it's not a matter of speed, it's a matter of how much can you sponge? And the best way to do it is to read, reading newspapers, reading novels. So unfortunately, there are some students that I encountered who only read novels. 
So when they translate, yes, they do translate eloquently, but their translation is more literary. Um, what if I offer them, uh, let's say, a media text? They wouldn't be able to translate it because they're not used to the technical or the diplomatic or, let's say, political context. So uh, for somebody who wants to acquire as much as possible, sponge off all this information, yes, watching TV, Netflix. So let's say you, you, you look at all these shows and you watch shows and you watch, uh, you, yeah, you do immerse in the storyline, but you also have to pay attention to the language being used. And also reading, reading as much as you can with, uh, without you realizing you have the mental lexicon where your mind is basically, it's almost like a sponge. It sponges all, it's basically sponges and acquires all of these words. You wouldn't remember that you acquired them, but when the right moment comes, and, you, and when you have pen and paper, uh, your, your mind will remind you and, and will retrieve that particular word. Uh, it happened to me so many times where when I'm translating and then I'm, I'm adding this word, I'm like, where did this word come from? I don't remember acquiring that word. It must have been me reading a book, uh, watching a TV show, watching a movie, etc. The mind does tricks all the time. It's all about... Um, acquiring as much as we can. You don't need to travel to, to actually be an, an, an amazing translator, a phenomenal translator. It's all about you accepting what's available. And of course, thanks to the internet and thanks to social media, you can acquire as much as you can without traveling. And I think that's one of the big benefits of, you know, of being a student in the 21st century is all the access to technology that we have, um, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, and as a professor of translation, what would you say is the biggest challenge for you that you face uh, in teaching and, and, and how do you, um, I guess, mitigate the challenges? The biggest challenge I would say, which also, uh, me answering this question will also answer the previous question. Um, I've said about, uh, you know, acquiring all the knowledge. One of the best ways to almost reach the native speaker level is to acquire dictionaries. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean Al-Mawad, Al-Munjid, Al-Mughni, Oxford, Longman. I'm talking about phraseology dictionaries. Mm. Uh, I always tell my student, and I sound like a broken record when I say it, so if they watch this interview, I hope they don't make fun of me for saying this, but because I do say it all the time. The 80% the 80 that is missing from every language student, um, the 20% that we acquire, 10% is grammar and 10% is vocabulary. The 80% that is missing is idioms, collocations, euphemisms, proverbs, oxymorons, pleonisms, all of these, they, 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 these what I could consider constitute a language. And you, you were discussing in your, in your latest videos about idioms and proverbs. Mm -hmm. They are very frequent in the language. So as a translator, as a language learner, the best thing to do is to acquire dictionaries of those expressions. Mm -hmm. um, in order to reach native speaker level. Now, how is this related to the challenges? Try to convince a 21st century student that Google Translate is not gonna help you. <laughs> actual dictionaries, actual diction, actual printed dictionaries are the ones that actually help you reach native speaker level. Unfortunately, they had to learn this the hard way. So yeah, trying to convince them that technology isn't everything. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't want to sound like an old dinosaur, uh, oh. <laughs> but it is, it, it is true. Machine, machines will never replace humans in terms of right. uh, machine translation. Oh, yeah. And especially not for Arabic. Like, I think, I mean, that's the thing. And I've always said, like, if Google Translate, like, it's one of the tools in your toolbox, but it's definitely not like anything I would ever rely on for anything serious just because of its limitations. And because Arabic is such a, I mean, it's because of all the different dialects and things, you know, I feel like. Many people from the Western world have a view where Arabic, it's like very binary. Do you speak Arabic? Yes. Okay, great. Be a translator for us. But dialect, you know, they could be speaking Moroccan. I barely understand Moroccan. or So it's like there's because there's such a variety within the language in terms of dialects and things. And that's such an interesting, yeah, um, challenge. Well, machine, trans machine translation will, will not understand two things. The complexity of the Arabic grammar and syntax. Arabic, we start with a verb. It's a, it's a VSO, verb, subject, object language. English is subject, verb, object. Uh, Shannon went to college. It's not like when we translate this, the best way to do it is dhahabat, 
شانا الى الجامعه but most students when you offer them the sentence to translate even the most senior ones for a split second they would translate it as شانا ذهبت الى الى الجامعه that's because they were influenced by the text that was given to them uh, they have to remember that arabic starts with a verb jumla fi'liya whereas english they always you always start with a subject so try to convince students that the syntax is different between the two languages. Imagine, imagine machine translation trying to comprehend this complexity of the grammar. And, and it's the same thing with, with metaphor. Arabic, Arabic metaphor is not easy to translate. I'm not, I'm not downplaying the role of other languages. English is really complex. But the thing with machine translation, why it succeeded with English and other other European and let's say Western languages and it did not succeed in Arabic was because I would say it doesn't mean that the other languages are not rich, they are. It's just Arabic has so many um, morphological structures, tasrif mm -hmm. al-af'al, uh, the same thing with met metaphorical imagery, the same thing with grammar. So it's not easy to have that. Most uh, machine translation enthusiasts would say, okay, I'll let the machine translate for me and then I'll edit it. Mm -hmm. But you haven't done anything. You're just you're just doing somebody else's job. So you you're you're admitting that the machine is not doing a perfect job in, in providing the final product. So uh, that's what I'm trying to convince my students that machines will never replace you. You might as well just stop translating you, translating with Google Translate. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. They learned that the hard way when I offered them poems and I told them try to translate these poems using Google Translate. They all, they all failed. I mean, mm -hmm. try, try translating Shakespeare using Google Translate. All right, oh, can't imagine. It, it won't be the same. So um, that's one of the challenges, trying to convince students that machine translation is, is, not, is not the ideal one. Once they get past yeah. that, yes, they're, they're off to the races. Yeah. And where do most of your students, um, <clears throat> what do they choose to focus on in terms of career? Um, the majority of them prefer to become translators, mm -hmm. but I, I've seen lately there is a shift in interpreting. Everybody and their mother want to turn into an interpreter. Mm. And since I don't teach interpreting, um, I told them I'm not the best person to do that. But I, but this is a funny story. I once had a student uh, who was really brilliant. He majored in um, mass communication and minored in translation. He was a former student of mine, one of the greatest, I would say. Um, when, he, when he graduated, he became an interpreter. I never taught him interpreting. He had that skill, that innate skill, it basically it blossomed. So he became an interpreter and now he's, he's actually offering workshops on interpreting. And oh, I keep wow. telling him, and I keep telling him the student has uh, basically um, outsmarted his, his, his teacher, his professor. Oh. He became an interpreter, and, I'm, and, and I cannot interpret to save my life. So when he became an interpreter, everybody, almost the majority of my students wanted to model themselves after him. They wanted to become interpreters as, as, as he became. He actually met uh, President Vladimir Putin in Russia. Oh, wow. um, he, was, he was interpreting for the Kuwaiti delegate team, and um, he was there. He interpreted uh, for, for, the, for the Kuwaiti parliament members. And when he came back to Kuwait and he told the story to, to the translation students, he, all of a sudden, everybody wants to be an interpreter, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's, it, it's best to master the skills of translation before you move on, before you cross over to interpreting. And that's one of the things I tried to convince my, the, the students. You can't be an interpreter without being a good translator first. What makes you a good interpreter? I would say you have to be quick-witted. You have to be, you shouldn't be absent-minded. You should be quick. You should think on your, you should think, you should land on your feet as, as, as quick as possible. Acquire as much terminology, as much jargon as you could. So I would say most students now prefer to be interpreters than translators. And for, students I mean going into who want to be interpreters how many I mean on average is there a certain number of like years or courses that they take in translation before they go on to interpreting 
Well, we offer 10 different uh, translation courses. They have to take eight out of those 10. Um, and then they have the option of uh, enrolling in the MA program in translation, which we also mm. offer. And we do offer to interpreting at the MA level. Usually those who want to become interpreters, they are the ones who usually pursue their MA degree in translation. Um, so they, they do acquire all the skills, theory and practice, and um, trying to link linguistics, uh, translation, real life situations, um, terminology, etc. So yeah, I would say the majority who enroll uh, at the MA program prefer to become interpreters. And there is a hidden factor, there is a hidden agenda. Interpreters get paid triple what translators get paid. Ah. That's a plus side, rightfully so. They, they're they are on nerves um, because there's no room for error. Whereas in translation, all you have to do is backspace mm -hmm. and you can change translation. Whereas in interpreting, you're live. So there's no room for error. That's true. Yeah, there's definitely a lot more pressure. Yeah. And, and I know we talked a bit about technology and how technology really can't replace, you know, what you do in terms of translation, at least for Arabic. Are there any tools though, like when you are translating something, um, I mean, they have like a computer assisted or um, like assisted translation, yeah. translation tools. So they don't actually translate for you, but it's like, do you have any specific ones that you recommend? Yeah, Trados, SDL, they, they, these are great tools. And for those who actually are subtitling, I would recommend um, Capwing or okay. into, for uh, subtitling. Um, it's free and um, they can rely on it for, for translating and subtitling shows, whether it's from English into Arabic and, and, and vice versa. And the beauty of it is that you can upload your subtitled video on YouTube uh, on that particular uh, Capwing. Okay, great. And there are also, mm -hmm. there are also machine trans, uh, sorry, there are also translation memories, mm -hmm. which I would recommend for anybody who's translating um, technical text. And by technical, I mean anything that is not literary. So medical, scientific, um, diplomatic, political, religious. Um, I would recommend almaani.com, which has okay. tons oh, of yeah. terminology. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that one, yeah. Even, even the United Nations uh, terminological database has tons of terminology free to be used. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll definitely um, I'll include the links uh, to those in the video description. I would also, I would also mm -hmm. recommend... Um, the use of dictionaries, although they're not, they're not the ideal cat tools, there are some great online dictionaries and even online apps. There are, there are tons of uh, apps for idioms. They are considered cat tools as well. Oh, okay. But they can download them for free. Um, um, it's called idioms and phrases. That's what, that's one of those, one of those famous when you get, and you can get an update on it constantly. So if it, if it contains, let's say, 5,000 idioms within the next three months, let's say you will receive another another thousand idioms and, and so on. So it gets updated constantly. So you do have you do have all of this wealth of knowledge uh, at the tip of your hand just for free. That's great. Yeah, that's so useful. Um, thank you so much. I'm really I'm so blown away by the depth of your knowledge in both Arabic and English. I mean, I'm just so, it's so incredible. So thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to, to talk to me today. I'm, I'm quite honored.